So the first part is about jaundice, uh, and um, both Kevin and Vinny talk about that. Um, the first part, the um, increased production, as in two mechanisms, and the um, the second two parts being the um, clearance or elimination. I think rather than just to say that uh, either it is um, physiological jaundice, we just need to think more and more about which particular area is the, 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 the main cause. And uh, even I'm going to uh, propose one terminology um, that uh, I think described the, the first uh, a mechanism more in increase RBC and then um, the, the shortened life sp uh, span. The third one is uh, when you talk about the UGT uh, polymorphism and the last one um, is um, he is now saying as the uh, starvation jaundice so I also agree that uh, we need to move away from the breast milk jaundice um, as in terminology. Um, again, I think when you already showed this diagram before, so I'm not going to say too much around that, just to uh, highlight that uh, from the breast cells hemolysis, one pathway is coming down here as a bilirubin, and then this N is the CO and carboxyhemoglobin, which uh, previously um, been measured only by the blood test, which is invasive, but there is a good correlation between carboxyhemoglobin and EDCO, as uh, Vinny um, also talked about it earlier. This is a term um, I'm going to suggest that uh, these babies, either they have pathological hemolysis, as we understand uh, ABO, um, recess, G6PD, and so on, but they also have um, the, any, every <coughs> newborn baby will have this um, physiological hemolysis, uh, which is at least in part the results of active and specific hemolysis involving a physiological mechanism to lower high fetal hematocrit, which would have needed for relatively uh, intrauterine hypoxia environment changing into higher oxygen level after birth. And the term uh, uh, the Dr. Christensen and a few other people use, uh, I think explain that as the neocytolysis is a transient low grade purposeful and physiological hemolysis. I will put the question to you later on that uh, whether the the test like EDCO, whether that also uh, prove or indicate um, not only the pathological, but also to some extreme form of uh, physiological hemolysis. And uh, Dr. Christensen also last year questioned that um, the, the cellular and uh, molecular mechanism for this resulting in shortened breast cell survival and increased CO excretion needs uh, further investigation. So I think this is the further work by Finley and colleagues in Stanford. This is uh, probably the third time uh, you are seeing uh, uh, that from all speakers, uh, which is a famous Bhutanese uh, nomogram. So I won't go into the details, but just to uh, highlight the, the, the uh, low risk, uh, medium risk, and high risk um, the, uh, being about the neurotoxicity. Um, I should have said at the beginning, I think the issue with the neonatal jaundice, obviously I'm the latecomer compared to uh, Kevin and Vinny because they are the experts. But what is really interesting about jaundice is that it happens to any newborn baby. And just trying to, so we, we, we don't need to be worried about every single baby, but the, as, as Kevin and Vinny said earlier, that one connectorus is too many. So how do we pick that up? And, and then how do we prevent? Um, I always tell my tra uh, trainees about, if you come to me with uh, a symptomatic uh, hypoglycemia or symptomatic polycythemia, as the neonatologist, as the clinician, I think we feel our duty because our job is to pick up the high risk of babies with the hypoglycemia and then polycythemia and trying to prevent they become symptomatic because we know that when a baby develops seizures due to hypoglycemia or seizures due to polycythemia maybe a bit too late, I think the consequences will be there. The same goes with the jaundice as well, just trying to understand the mechanism more and trying to pick up or prevent the babies who are with the neuro, uh, the, the toxicity is the important one. Uh, I thought Vinny was going to show this, uh, um, um, the diagram, but I don't think he did in his presentation, uh, which I picked up from his last publication. I think his uh, proposal or hypothesis is that uh, if EDCO testing is going to be added around 24 hours of age. Uh, is it showing up there with the, yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, and then whether we can reduce these uh, 
the risk areas from um, the from the median risk down to lower level and then the high risk level down here i think that is the the question that um, we, we need to discuss that um, so now moving on to the second part um, uh, medway experience and etco so I'm sure um, the clinical colleagues in the audience, either you are a doctor or you're a nurse or you are a midwife, um, we haven't uh, used, you probably heard about the, uh, the, the, the indicators or the tests that we can look at the hemolysis, but we haven't, I haven't um, uh, used the, uh, any devices to measure any sort of uh, um, uh, the EDCO as the degree of hemolysis. So I kind of learned that uh, uh, recently and then, um, and then talking to uh, Professor Bhutani and also the, uh, uh, the, the company about uh, the technology and uh, very interesting concept for me. Um, so uh, the initial idea was that uh, um, Dr. Ives and I will join the uh, global study that we need to talk about earlier uh, with the 2,000 babies across the, the world. And so we thought that we would um, Joined that global study, uh, but when I uh, went through the R and D application and uh, ethical applications, I think that was the the issue about data sharing and a few other aspects. So although we are still going through that process, I was just interested about the the device and uh, how easy or difficult to use, and how do we uh, understand um, the, the the results, and also how can we. Um, uh, the link that into our day-to-day -day clinical practice because as I said earlier, um, my, my knowledge about this as a trainee and the being consultant is, is zero. Um, 2010 NICE guidelines uh, did not recommend um, EDCO and uh, the 2016 NICE guidelines did not um, look into the uh, uh, EDCO, so that was not reviewed. Uh, it wasn't included in the scope and then so it is a question mark area. So um, what I did was I approached um, um, Capnia, who kindly um, uh, lent me the, uh, the, the device and then uh, I supplied the, um, the, the cannula. So we did uh, a product evaluation in Medway. So it is, um, you've you, you seen the, the device there. So um, it, it, it is uh, uh, measuring a, a breath sample. So it is a, a single prong. So go into uh, uh, one nostril and takes uh, up to 30 seconds before the, the device detect the, um, the, the, the breath. And then after that, um, you can remove the, um, the, the sampling set and then the device will uh, show the EDCO results in three to four minutes. That is a FDA approved NC mark. So here you can see uh, this uh, sampling set, so this N will be attached to the, the monitor and this little prong is attached to the, uh, the, the baby one nostril and it is a one step assembly and, uh, and uh, it is um, uh, very non-invasive therefore the, uh, the care of the baby uh, it's not going to be affected and very uh, easy to use and then it, it is a uh, immediate result so within uh, three to four minutes you get the results. So our experience, uh, because it is CE mark, uh, we did a product evaluation after discussion with our R&D department. And we, what we wanted to do was we wanted to see uh, the clinician, so uh, the nurses, um, so particularly the research nurse, uh, the ANNP, um, the um, <coughs> nurse educator, SHO registrar, doc, uh, consultant, mixture of group were trained to use that. So we wanted to see the clinician experience, how easy to use that. We also want to ask the parents what they think about the, the tests. And also, I always think about baby experience. I know we can't ask them, but you can always uh, get the uh, information out of it. Although that wasn't the research study um, based on um, uh, Vinny's uh, global study, uh, patient information leaflets, we produce a similar kind of leaflets, so we discuss with the parents. Um, and let me just explain a little bit about the uh, Medway uh, Community Pathway, which may or may not be the same as other trusts in the country. So uh, as other part of the country, the low risk so-called full-time babies will be discharged uh, within 24 hours, and then the midwife will visit the baby on day three, 
and then if the baby clinically jaundice, uh, they would um, not always, but usually, uh, measure uh, bilirubin by transcutaneous meters. Although the NICE guidelines say more than 250 uh, micromole per liter <laughs> refer back to the hospital for uh, serum bilirubin measurement, TSB, in Medway we use 200 uh, as because it is a still a new method and we wanted to make sure that um, it is safe to do so. So in this particular uh, product evaluation project, what we did was when the baby transfer, uh, referred back to the hospital uh, and then the baby will have um, the repeat DCB measurement and also a blood test and then we will give parents the information leaflets and ask their agreement uh, that whether we can add the EDC or measurement and explaining that it is not going to influence the treatment because the treatment will still be dependent on the serum bilirubin measurements as we, our normal clinical practice. Um, because of the maternal smoking in the third trimester or postnatally can affect the uh, baby's ETCO if the mother smokes in the third trimester or postnatally that baby will be excluded. So um, we had uh, uh, 54 babies tested with the parental <coughs> agreement and uh, we have data on 46 babies for all three measurements, TCB, DSB, and EDCO. Um, the seven babies, uh, we didn't get the uh, EDCO measurements, four due to increased respiratory rate, and then three with the machine error. One baby after DCB and EDCO available, um, the, the uh, DSB results came back uh, as not available. So altogether, uh, we had data on 46 babies. And out of that, um, due to the uh, DSB treatment threshold, uh, 15 babies were admitted or readmitted because they've been discharged from the maternity uh, unit for phototherapy. And then um, 31 uh, babies were discharged home. Uh, first of all, um, the, uh, the, the feedback is that uh, it is user friendly and very easy to use no parental concerns raised and tolerated well by the babies. Um, a few of these babies um, continue to be breastfed um, during the, 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 um, the, the EDCO measurements. The first one, which is not about EDCO, I just want to show you because there was a question uh, earlier about the DCB and D, uh, DSB measurements. So uh, this is the, the stachygram on the, um, uh, the uh, <coughs> Y axis being the DSB and then uh, X axis being DCB. And just to note that we had one baby with a very high uh, 451, um, the micromole of the uh, DSB level, but DCB was low. Otherwise, um, they are uh, uh, correlating well. This is the, the data on uh, ETCO uh, in the uh, Y axis and then uh, for the um, uh, the x axis is the DCB values. And um, um, previous reading, uh, although Vinny showed you a, a bit more detail about um, the EDCO level 1.7, um, my reading and understanding very, very, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the guide is that uh, EDCO more than 2.5 is a high risk, uh, 1.5 to 2.5 is a medium risk, and then less than 1.5 is a low risk. So in our data on the uh, 46 babies, you can see that there are four babies, uh, one with a 4.1, and then one with a 2.9, and then two with a 2.6. So these are the four babies would have been uh, above the um, uh, 2.5 level, and then some babies are below 1.5, and then a lot of babies in between uh, 1.5 to 2.5. This is the uh, 15 babies on the phototherapy. Uh, you will note that uh, out of the uh, EDCO more than uh, uh, four babies with the EDCO more than 2.5, two babies require phototherapy, other two didn't. And then this particular one uh, below 1.5 requiring phototherapy. Uh, again, as I just said earlier, that uh, we would use DSB as our um, uh, the, the, the decision uh, making test for that. So. This is on the 15 babies. And then the babies who are not admitted, um, and uh, the, the baby with a high EDCO, uh, 4.1, and then another one with the, uh, the uh, 2.9 here, 
other babies are uh, 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 are not um, in in the um, high risk as uh, Venice um, said earlier. So if you put all of them in together, which I think this is the, in, um, so our the data. So I'm not going to say anything about statistical significant or not because it is uh, only babies on 46 babies. This is about we are trying to learn the uh, the the, um, the the device and the technology here. Um, so in a uh, total of 46 babies here, as I said earlier, that uh, four babies with more than 2.5 and two requiring phototherapy and two discharge, which I will talk about those two babies in a minute. And then this is the uh, 1.5 to 2.5, supposed to be uh, at the medium risk, and then below 1.5, 16 babies. This one, apart from that, other babies were discharged. Um, Again, uh, we need to understand that um, the, the um, denominator or the babies we tested are not the same as what uh, other studies were uh, uh, are reporting because this is the babies who's supposed to be clinically jaundiced, diagnosed by the midwife and already having uh, DCB more than 200 as a referral criteria back to us. So these are the four babies who had uh, EDC or more than 2.5. So the first two columns are the babies who didn't need uh, uh, phototherapy. So the first baby is uh, 40 weaker, 67 hours old, didn't need phototherapy, ETC was 4.1. The TCB was 317, but because of DSB was 255, which was uh, below the phototherapy range, this baby went home. One interesting, uh, the, uh, uh, the maternal history, I am not sure the significance of that, uh, but I can't help thinking there must be some, de some degree of uh, uh, relationship is that uh, mother, because in Medway, our main population is white Caucasian. So this mother is um, African black and then she arrived just before delivery. And then to, after receiving anti-malaria treatment, um, the, you know, a few days before the arrival here. So I don't know whether that could affect the, um, the hemolysis. Uh, expert may say a bit more about that. The second baby is uh, another 40, uh, 39 weeker uh, and uh, at 60 hours old, an EDCO level of 2.9. At that time, the DCB was 255 and DSB was 262. Um, but because of they were within 50 uh, micromole, the ba though that baby was reviewed again next day uh, and then the following day. But even at that time, although there was a trend in increasing bilirubin, the baby didn't uh, touch on the, the threshold. Uh, treatment. The next two are EDCO of 2.6. The last one is interesting one because you will note that uh, although the baby is 40 weaker, by the time baby was seen only 30 hours. So, so this is a baby that the mother contacted the midwife saying that I think my baby is jaundiced. Can you please come and see my baby earlier? And then the midwife went in and then did the DCB and then referred to us because it was more than 200. That baby had the um, the uh, um, DCB in hospital of 252 with a DSB of 220, but for the 30 weeks, uh, sorry, 30 hours, and that was in the treatment uh, range. And this is the only baby who we had uh, uh, a positive DAT, mum being O positive and babies A positive. So the point Vinny was talking about earlier that um, the hemolytic uh, jaundice, sometimes you see it earlier. So this is, a, I think, good pickup by the mother diagnosing jaundice earlier. The next, um, um, the, uh, the, the two cases, because the case, or the case, or the, the reference are 11 and 14, because we had three measurements, but these two are the same babies. Uh, the baby is initially um, 17 hours old and then seen again, in fact, seen again between those two episodes, but we didn't do the EDCO at the time. Uh, and initially starting with the EDCO 1.8, and then the next one was 1.3. But by at the time, 276 is just touching the uh, treatment threshold because that baby is 37 hours, uh, 37 weeks, so you would have a lower tr treatment threshold. The last one is the, the dot you saw earlier in the DSB and DCV graph is that uh, proportionately a lot higher DSB compared to DCV, but this baby is the one with the 13% um, weight loss with the uh, hypernatremic dehydration. So in the mechanism I was talking to you about earlier, I, I, I wonder whether this baby had uh, also delay clearance, not only uh, from the EDCO point of view, it's a, it's a um, medium risk. 
So that is uh, our experience so far about, about um, using ETCO in Medway. The next uh, area I'd like to talk about is the, the, the global and Chico studies. So um, the global studies, I think as Vinny said, that he has recruited uh, over 300 babies in, in US, is um, looking at uh, the babies uh, equal or more than 35 weeks. Uh, the objective are looking at normal data and also to look at the natural history and then to stratify either the babies are at most or least likely risk of hemolysis. Um, and then uh, he is hoping to uh, uh, recruit 2,000 babies uh, globally. And I think these, uh, he also touched upon those, I won't mention uh, any further. But just in the uh, schedule of events, just to draw your attention, the last two lines. So the first one is going to be the babies who are more than six hours old uh, are going to have the EDCO daily for the first four days, which is this one. And then the babies who are readmitted uh, and are going to be uh, for uh, phototherapy are going to be starting later, up to six days of age. Again, the measurement will be daily for uh, um, four days. So. When uh, Vinny and Kevin and I met to discuss about um, the doing UK study within the uh, global study, the initial idea was we would recruit uh, up to 200 babies between Medway and uh, Oxford. Um, but then, as I said earlier, that uh, talking to uh, my own R&D department and the um, ethics application uh, about the, um, the data sharing uh, with US, so now, the, the final stage at the moment is that uh, we are going to do a UK study. We will analyze ourselves, publish the data, then the anonymous data will be pulled into the global study so that uh, um, we can still have the uh, data around uh, at the world. But then uh, after uh, we've done the, uh, uh, the product evaluation uh, and then with the more uh, papers recently published, uh, we are now again discussing about how this technology, if we are going to implement in the UK, uh, what would be more useful and what even adding into the more knowledge about what um, uh, Vinny has already learned. So we are thinking about doing either at or uh, before babies are six hours old, because talking to the midwives earlier, I think the magic bullet in a few years' time would be that uh, the baby at the six hours having a transcutaneous uh, baby review measurement and then measuring EDCO and then you, you, you do the risk analysis and then make the plan about what will happen to that baby. Or we can do more of the, 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 the data we already have like in community referral. Um, the, my other interest is about looking more detail into phototherapy. So um, whether at the beginning, uh, Vinny already talking about uh, if we risk assess more clearly, then hopefully less babies will be receiving phototherapy and in fact, whether ETCO can be part of the uh, analysis or effectiveness of the phototherapy. Uh, my last part is the uh, NICE guidelines. So, um, um, no, we haven't messed up the um, 2010 guidelines, Kevin. We just look at the areas which needs a bit more clarity, shall we say. So, um, um, so the first one was up, uh, published in 2010. As uh, Kevin said, that he was part of it, and then uh, the 2016 guidelines, I was part of it. So we only look at particularly because how nice work is that uh, there will be a scope uh, um, agreed, and uh, you, you you cannot add or delete. It has to be has to be scope within the scope area. So we only look at the uh, threshold table and how to measure bilirubin level and then the phototherapy aspect. And as I said earlier, EDCO was not reviewed. And um, so this is, uh, again, graph that Kevin already uh, shown you, so, but we didn't change the uh, threshold graph. But Kevin was saying earlier about whether this line could have been dotted line rather than straight line, but that, that, wasn't, that wasn't changed. Um, This is, that was the threshold table, which um, I don't know how the midwives cope with at that, at, you know, this for the six years, because the problem we had at that time was, if you remember that there are four columns at that time, the first column with those level as uh, age specific bilirubin, the action is that uh, to repeat bilirubin six to 12 hours, 
I don't think that was ever implemented because if you think about that, uh, uh, a midwife seeing the baby around 4 p.m. at home, and then if the bilirubin threshold uh, levels here, then you are supposed to repeat the bilirubin 10 p.m. to 4 p.m., then no one will visit there. So, and then the next one is about here, if you can see, consider phototherapy. Again, that wasn't helpful, uh, but other two are helpful. So now, in 2016, we got rid of those two columns, and you only now got um, the phototherapy and then exchange transfusion. So that is one change. The question is, um, if you got uh, bilirubin level below the threshold line, how do you uh, monitor that? So that uh, we put it in there saying that if it is within 50 micromole per liter, the babies with a high risk, uh, risk factors, that should be repeated in 18 hours. So that will come into more uh, practical aspects of the uh, community midwifery review. And then if without risk factor, we should review that within 24 hours. If the um, bilirubin level is a threshold for more than 50 micromole, you do not need to repeat it again. The other thing we did was that we specify when you should do serum bilirubin rather than transcutaneous. So in the first 24 hours, gestation less than 35 weeks, when the meter is not available, when the uh, meter shows more than 250, and then the uh, bilirubin level uh, are at or above the treatment threshold or for the subsequent measurements. So these are the things we um, clarify more in the guideline. This is, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, I think it's a summary um, that uh, I'm going to suggest that uh, when we see um, a baby with a neonatal jaundice, there could be a four scenarios um, that also summarize what uh, Dr. Ives and Professor Bhutani said earlier. So you can have a baby with a scenario one, is that this baby has a production, increased production. The hemolysis can be pathological as we know it, or excessive physiological hemolysis. And uh, if we are going to measure ETCO, that would be high. And this baby unfortunately also got a problem with the clearance or elimination. I think these are the babies, if we are going to measure total bilirubin, it's going to be very high. Again, age specific. The next scenario is that uh, this baby has got a reduction problem. ETC will be high, but uh, good uh, clearance. In that case, I think depend on uh, how much is the problem with the uh, uh, hemolysis the bilirubin can be high or can be within normal or below the treatment threshold. Scenario three is um, the production is normal or, or no excess hemolysis, but a poor clearance and then you can have a normal or raised bilirubin. And the last group would be the lowest uh, risk group. Um, what I don't know is that uh, um, how do we pick up this you know, second and third group and then trying to pick up the first group early enough so that we can prevent um, the, um, the neurotoxicity in babies. This is my last slide. Um, I think I, I know some of these answers, some of these I don't know, so hopefully that will come up in the um, uh, uh, panel discussion later on. Uh, first of all, um, does ETCO, uh, which at the moment seems to be uh, easiest, uh, most uh, non-invasive and then uh, accurate tests uh, for uh, checking hemolysis predict both postnatal pathological and physiological hemolysis. I think so. Also talking to uh, Vinny, uh, Vinny also thinks that that should also pick up the um, uh, extreme or excessive physiological hemolysis. How does this together with the uh, bilirubin give us in clinical management, which I think um, with the various pathways we, we need to discuss that. Uh, what impacts NICE 2016 guidelines has on variable clinical practices in the NHS? Because um, I, I know that uh, um, the um, colleagues from King's and a few other places, um, and, and uh, there is still no transcutaneous um, meters available widely. And uh, some babies are coming back to general pediatrics, some coming back to neonatal units when they diagnose jaundice on day one, day two, day seven, whenever. Um, so how, I, I don't know, the, 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 the table change should help. But on the other hand, there's a more emphasis on about the monitoring. And um, the, the Bhutani pathway, which is the adding uh, EDC I showed you earlier, could that apply in the UK? Um, so hopefully in the, um, in the panel discussion, we can discuss a way forward. Thank you very much.